Welcome back to the channel, folks. In this century, we'll be taking a look at Hans Gruber from the 1988 Christmas classic, Die Hard. While John McClane might be one of the greatest screen heroes, it's safe to say that Hans Gruber played just as much of an iconic role in making Die Hard one of the quintessential action movies of the century, one that has stood the test of time and set a formula for other films in the same genre. A dignified and silver-tongued criminal, Hans was a villain who proved to be a worthy adversary, an exceptional thief who was a genius in his own right, wielding the traits of his craftiness and callousness to pave the way for his greed. As the idiom goes, the clothes maketh the man, and this is perhaps a good place to start with Hans. Of all the possible attire he could wear, it's insightful that he chooses to be sharply dressed in a fine suit, unlike the more functional style of clothing that his colleagues wear, given the nature of their occupation and the long night ahead of them. Han's choice to adorn himself this way indicates that he is a refined man of class, and perhaps the first hint of the magnitude of a threat he is as someone with two sets of suits from John Phillips in his wardrobe is likely to have access to considerable wealth and resources. Beyond displaying his level of class, Han's attire also serves to set him apart as the leader of his group. A noteworthy position, to say the least, as I'm sure it would take a rather robust personality to keep such a gang of outlaws in submission. Han's is very much a natural leader, and it doesn't take long in seeing him interact before we get this impression. He speaks in a deep, languid voice that naturally exudes a sense of authority, and throughout the hiccups in his mission, he remains very much calm and composed, simply redirecting his efforts to the next logical course of action. But of course, the element of Hans that makes him a person worth following in the eyes of his gang is his level of intellect. Given what little we know of Hans, such as his uncanny ability to switch accents and his disdain for American culture, it's likely that he has been a rather well-traveled man. Of his own admission, he was classically educated, with perhaps an affinity for arithmetic and geometry, in light of his fondness for attention to detail along with his hobby of constructing models as a boy. It takes an artist to truly appreciate art, and Hans's admiration of the company's bridge in Indonesia perhaps reveals an intricate knowledge of engineering on his end. Beyond the field of numbers, Hans' high level of intelligence is also somewhat hinted at by his remarkable memory, being able to cite detail after detail of Takaji's biography offhand in detail. Incidentally, this moment also serves to highlight Hans's ability to intimidate, Given his extensive knowledge of a public figure like Takaji, it's more than likely that he already knows what he looks like. Hence, his request for Takaji to reveal himself was probably just a ruse to set the right atmosphere he wanted, pacing around his captive audience to let the fear sink in. In returning to the topic of Hans's intelligence, this is evident in the ingenuity of his plan attacking a corporate skyscraper in the middle of a festive season when its occupants are low, combined with the subject of his end goal, 640 million in bearer bonds, untraceable, without the need for laundering, and portable, being significantly lesser in weight than if it were in cash form. The ideal payday for a criminal and a Christmas dream come true for Hans and his unsavory group. The pinnacle of the ingenuity of Hans, however, lies in his greatest weapon, namely his misdirection, posing as an anarchist so as to flip the script, ironically using police protocol to advance his criminal goals and bypassing the final lock in the vault. As he proudly declares, Hans is an exceptional thief, one whose meticulous nature has left nothing to chance but even someone as prepared as Hans would be put to the test when an uncontrollable element comes into play, the fly in the ointment in the form of an out-of-town police detective being invited to the party. Despite John being a thorn in his side, Hans remains mostly calm, 
and this is especially important to his success given that his men were starting to either panic or get enraged, which, if left unchecked, would lead to the hostages perceiving a loss of control. Hans simply recalculates and adapts to the incursions to his plan, oftentimes in the spur of the moment, such as when he puts on a fake accent in order to trick John, a risky move given that John has already been hearing his voice on the comms. But given the situation, it was the best possible move for Hans since he was unarmed. Shortly after, Hans' ability to salvage the situation is again seen when he tells his men to shoot the glass, knowing that if they can't stop John, they can at least immobilize him. And even if the logical decision requires some sacrificial loss, which we see when Hans instructs his men to blow the roof, although Carl might still be there, he demonstrates that unlike his men, he has no reservations in committing to the necessary measures. But while Hans is largely in control of his emotions, we see that he is a man of little patience when his demands are denied, with him defaulting to his method of counting to three to expedite compliance. In his brief interrogation with Takaji, Hans actually has no need for him to unlock the first safeguard of the vault, given that he will eventually need to wait for the FBI to cut the power anyway. More than likely, Hans's choice to execute him stemmed out of an exhaustion of his patience, combined with perhaps being insulted over Takaji's attempt to stall him. Yet in all this, it's a testament to Hans' leadership as well as his cognitive and emotional intelligence that much of the gang's success rests on his shoulders. Hence the foregone conclusion, Hans has the traits of someone who would excel in any field he dedicates himself to but unfortunately the route of a criminal appealed to him the most. Which brings us to his greed, the overarching driver for all of Hans' actions. We learn that he was formerly part of a radical anarchist group in Germany, but left for unspecified reasons. But in light of how he laughs at Takaji's notion of him being an anarchist, it's suggestible that Hans ultimately doesn't care for the cause of any group save for one that would line his pockets and guarantee an early retirement. The film deliberately makes a point of this, when in the moment that Hans is finally within grasp of the object of his greed, it's interlaced with the melody of Beethoven's Ode de Joy, signifying that this long-awaited moment is not just Hans's Christmas gift to himself, but more importantly the crescendo of his life's achievements. But while Hans may not care for any radical cause, it's possible that he does have a genuine vendetta against the notion of corporate greed, a fact that he alludes to when he compares the exploits of the Takaji Corporation to that of Alexander the Great, who wept in sorrow when there were no more worlds to conquer. So while the heist does benefit him financially, perhaps in Han's mind it also serves the double purpose of sticking it to the wealthy elite. It also lends some justification for his crime when he attempts to trivialize it, mentioning that the $640 million would simply amount to 10 days of operating capital for the parent company. With that in mind, if Han's theft of the bearer bonds was the full extent of his misdeeds, then perhaps he would be a less guilty criminal, as stealing excess wealth from people who would be marginally affected by the loss would be a less egregious offense. But it's not the case, as Hans demonstrates that he is quite willing to venture into the most heinous of crimes to quench his greed, and no aspect of his plan highlights this more than his endgame of blowing the roof and the executives in order to secure a clean getaway. As professional and logical as he was throughout his operation, Hans makes his biggest blunder when he succumbs to the temptation of taking things personal with John, attempting to savor the kill. But perhaps it was long in the making, given that John has been repeatedly sabotaging his plans. It proves to be an emotionally charged mistake, leaving him vulnerable and culminating in sending him falling down to his untimely demise. A brilliant tactician and quite the exceptional thief, Hans Gruber was a criminal mastermind who used his talents for nefarious purposes. A sterling leader worthy of the submission of his devious followers, 
and an intellectual genius who left no stone unturned in the almost flawless execution of his sordid plan, one that callously disregarded human life for the sake of financial gain, and established him as one of cinema's most notorious villains.